Okay, All right, y'all turn to Romans 5. We're going to continue our study tonight in Romans 5. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Our Father, we thank You for dealing with us in grace and in mercy. Lord, we've done nothing to deserve anything, and yet in Christ Jesus, You've set Your affection on us, and we thank You for this. We bless Your name because of it, and Lord, help us to magnify Your grace and Your Word to everyone we see. Father, we thank You for giving us a Savior. We thank You for giving us a way back home to You. But above all things, we thank You for removing the fear of death in this world and replacing it with the hope of everlasting life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's read the section we're in again, Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, I intend to deal with 20 and 21 tonight, or mostly 20, but he says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, y'all remember, Paul's whole point here is the assurance of salvation, and he's showing us the reason that a person that's in Christ can be certain that you're saved and you'll remain saved. And so as he's going down through here, y'all remember what he did. He's making a comparison. And early on in verse 12 he started. And he said something that needed explained. And that in Adam all sinned. So he broke away into a parenthesis and he explains what it means that we all sinned in Adam. Not that we're all sinners because of Adam, although that's true. He's saying in that one act God wrote down the human race as condemned. And that one act of Adam condemned all of us. But then he goes on to explain the, the parallel that by the same token, those that God saves, He wrote down by the one act of Christ justified. Now, just like we had nothing to do with the act that condemned us, we have nothing to do with the act that justifies us. And yet we know it's true. And then he went on and explained how it is a parallel, but there's contrast there. Now, he never gets back to it until verse 18 when he says, Therefore, the parentheses is over and he tells us what's true of Adam and his federal headship is true of Christ. Now, he's gone through all of this and it's like Paul's ready to depart. He's ready to move on to his next subject. But I, I love the way that he does does this, he, he always makes a segue. Um, in other words, he'll make a statement that will sum up what he said, but it introduces what he's about to. And this 20 and 21, that's exactly what it is. When he says, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now when you tell someone that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that person, if they understood what you've said, is logically going to say, well, then you're telling me that it doesn't matter. We can just sin all we want. We're saved. Look at chapter 6. Remember, there were no chapter breaks. Look what he says immediately. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
You see, he's leading into his next subject. And in a lot of ways, verse 20 and 21 is a summary of everything Paul has said from Romans chapter 1 in the middle all the way through where we've been going. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But in chapter 6 and 7, what he's going to do is he's really going to take the, the statement he's made about sin versus grace, and he's going to explain it. And that's really what chapter 6 and 7 is all about. It's like a, uh, him expounding these two verses. So I just, I just wanted to show you all that. And look, one way that you can know that you have uh, shared the gospel with somebody correctly. If somebody understands what you say when you share the gospel with them and you tell them that it's by the blood of Christ, it's not by our works, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. If the person has understood, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll respond with, well, if what you're saying is true, then sin, we can do whatever we want. Now, that's not the truth, but at least you know something. They have understood the gospel because their reply is, you're telling me that we ain't got nothing to do with it. And yes, that's what I'm telling you. Now, we know the gospel goes on to say, no, we don't just sin all we want. But he hadn't, he hadn't arrived at that yet. That's what chapter 6 is going to be about. But what he does here, notice how he starts it. He says, moreover, in verse 20. Now, moreover is an interesting word. It means something additional. He, I'll tell y'all what it means literally for us. You know, we write a letter. I don't guess CN has made it to this point yet. You write your letter and you get done and you sign it and then you have another thought. What do we do? P.S. Postscript. See, Paul has said all of this and he's about to embark in his next subject, but there's something like he's left a loose end. Something's kind of hanging. Now I'm going to show y'all what the thing that's hanging is. Go back to uh, verse 13. He said, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And then he goes on and explains everything. Well, that mention of the law, can you all imagine how hard a Jewish Christian, uh, how hard a time he would have with what Paul has just said? Because essentially Paul has said two things. The law cannot justify us. Now a Christian would finally believe that, but you all realize what he's just added here? Not only does the law not justify us, it's not even the law that actually condemns us. Now, a Jew would say, well, wait a minute. You're telling me then that the law serves no purpose. If the law can't justify us, then the law doesn't even condemn us. Now, when I say the law doesn't condemn us, what do I mean by that? He's explained to us how we got condemned, hadn't he? Are we condemned by Moses' law? No, although it... it condemns our sin, doesn't it? How did we all wind up condemned? By Adam's sin. Okay? And remember, that's what Paul has said. He said, look, Adam's sin and death passed upon all men. But there was a period of, uh, let's see, 2,000, 2,500 years here before the law of Moses. And what he says is, if all these people were condemned before Moses' law, then it ain't Moses' law that condemned them, and that's what he's proven. How were you and I born condemned? Because of what Adam did. God took Adam as the head, and when Adam failed, God marked down the human race as rejected, condemned. And so, again, he's mentioned the law, and it's like he feels like he's got to go back and say that. Okay? So Paul's about to close the comparison, but he's got to pick up on this now. We're not uh, justified by the law. We're not condemned by the law. Okay, we're condemned by Adam, justified by Christ. So what do you think the Jewish believer in Paul's day would have said? I can hear one of them saying, hold on a minute. All right, we're condemned by Adam, justified by Christ. Well, what was Moses for? Why? I mean, they really lifted Moses up on a pedestal, didn't they? I mean, literally, they would say, well, why did Moses ever come? You're telling us Moses was a waste of time, that the law meant nothing. And Paul says, no, the law served a purpose. And that's what he's going to explain. Okay, so let's look at this tonight. All right. <clears throat> the law entered, he says. Notice verse 20. Moreover, the law entered. Now, this is interesting. There's two words here, entered. And the, the same word that's used in verse 12, go back and look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Right? Now, how did sin enter into the world? What, is that, what does that imply? It implies that sin was outside. Right? And sin entered inside. 
Okay, so was there a time when there was no sin? Yes. Yeah, when God first creates Adam, I'll just put a thing here, there is no sin. Now, there was a time when there was no sin, period. But at some point, and I wouldn't argue with anybody over when, Satan sinned. So whenever Adam and Eve sinned, sin was already in existence, but sin wasn't in the world, the order of human. It wasn't in the human race. It wasn't in our world, and yet it came into our world. And the moment that sin passed from outside into our world, that sin passed upon all men. So there's sin then, and sin is there all along, isn't it? Okay. Now what he means here in verse 20 is a little bit different. The word is a little different than entered. Okay. He says, moreover, the law entered. Now look, same thing. If the law entered, then that means that there was a time when the law was not there. And so there came a period when the law entered in, right? But the word that he uses here for entered in the law here, it doesn't mean uh, just, just regular entered. It means to come in beside. He, Paul adds, the, the, adds a, a word to it, a prefix, para, P-A-R-A. You know, we say like a, 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 a paragraph or, you know, that. Para means alongside of. Now, what he's saying is that the law, let me get me a color for law. We'll use this green one. He said that the law came in alongside of. So the law had a starting point, didn't it? Okay, Moses' law. It starts here and look at comes in alongside of. Now that's the idea here in the passage. And what he's going to go on to explain to us is that the law wasn't just a waste of time. The law came into existence to work side by side with sin that had already entered in earlier. One came in and began doing something and then the other came in and worked side by side along with it. Okay, that, That's the whole idea. Y'all just Keep that in mind, and we'll, we'll try and move on. All right, now, <clears throat> again, to come in alongside, it's an addition to something that wasn't there. Go to Galatians 3. <clears throat> Paul puts it this way in Galatians 3. Verse uh, 19. He said, Wherefore then serveth the law? Okay, now what he's talking about is what is the purpose of the law? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Notice he says the law was added. Now, when something is added, something wasn't there to begin with, right? The other thing it tells us is that the law is not the main thing. In, in this pair here, what's the more important fundamental, the law or sin? sin? Sin. Sin's the problem, and the law is just something in relation to that problem. And so when he says the law was added, the law of Moses was added. Look, it was added here till. Okay. So the law served a purpose for a period of time. Now, what exactly was that purpose? It aided sin, that's for sure. Okay? The law came in. Now watch, he tells us, go back to Romans 5, and he tells us why. <coughs> you know, this is really one of the most uh, overlooked subjects. It's not popular to preach law and sin and whatnot, but you'll find out that before every great revival they ever had, there was a great awakening to the law. And I don't mean people going under the law. People begin to look at the law and begin to see something, that they had misunderstood the law. You know, most people think that the law is a means of gaining entry to heaven, or it's a means of just showing us right and wrong, how to live a good life, and that sort of thing. But the law's not. The law was specifically given by God. Look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that. Now, when he says that, that means in order that. Okay, so why did the law enter? In order that the offense might abound. Now, what offense? What's the offense we've been dealing with all through this passage? The sin. Is it our sin? 
It's Adam's. It's not the offenses. You remember he talked about our sins being many offenses, but he said, whereby by Adam's one offense. So what the law does then, the law comes in and it's added in order that the offense of Adam might abound. Okay? <clears throat> now, uh, law entered that the offense of Adam, as well as all subsequent offenses might abound, but it's specifically that one of Adam. Now, what does he mean? The law teaches us about sin. Okay, that's what the law does. Now, the, he said that the law come in that, that sin might abound. Y'all see that word abound? All right, that sin might abound. There's two words here that he uses, and I want to make sure we look at the difference between them. When he says the law entered that the offense might abound. He says, but where sin abounded, same word he just used, he said grace does much more abound. Now do y'all see the four words did much more abound? That's one Greek word and it's a completely different word than just abound. It means something different, okay? And so what it means here in the first case, where sin abounded, the Greek word's planazo, it means increased. Sin increased. Sin existed in a growing abundance. In other words, sin multiplied. Okay? So, sin was in the world, right? Remember when he said that? Now, how did he prove that sin was in the world before the law? Because everybody died, right? He said, even those that had not sinned, like Adam sinned, died. So, sin was in the world. But the moment the law comes in, the law does something to sin. What does it do? It makes it abound. Now, abound to increase. Look, I'm going to draw it darker. It gives it a different uh, character. In other words, it gives sin a clarity that it didn't have before the law. I've all, I know I've told you all this uh, example, but I'll just use it again. I was on a job site one time in Fairhope. It was a new neighborhood, and uh, I worked for these developers and doing like waterfalls and entrances and all that. And uh, of course, the people would come in and they'd be putting in the streets and then the utilities. And the guy I knew from, from Car Club was uh, putting in the water, and he was out there. And I was about to eat lunch, and he was. They were getting the water hooked up and all. And I jumped off the backhoe and I walked over and got my lunch. And I come over and I started talking to him, eating my sandwich. And he said, "Ain't you gonna watch?" your hands. I, I mean, it's construction. You know, I'm sure y'all know there is no sink in a port let right? So, but I said to him, I said, no, nah, I ain't worried about it. He said, don't you know what's on your hands? And I said, yeah, dirt. He said, let me show you something. Now, he was looking, testing the water. So he went and got like a piece of glass and he rubbed the glass on my hand and he put it under his microscope and adjusted it and looked and he said, take a look. And I looked under that microscope, and <laughs> y'all wouldn't believe what was on my hands. <laughs> it was moving. I mean, it was horrible, right? It was like, I mean, it was, it was horrible. And so I was like, oh, and I said, man, let me go wash my hands. And he started laughing. He said, you can wash the dirt off. He said, but that'll still be there. And I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. He said, that's on your skin. He said, you've got these mic. It's always there. Now, were they there? Yeah. Did I know they were there? Mm -hmm. I knew my hands were dirty, but I didn't know how dirty. What did it take for me to really realize how foul my hands were? To see it. To the see mic magnifying it. glass. That's what the law did. The law came in and magnified sin. You know, we've got it in the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount for us, right? You say, well, the law says thou shalt not commit adultery. The law says thou shalt not. And we say, okay, that's it. I won't do that. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Let me put that under the magnifying glass. It says not to do it, but that's not the end of it. It's not telling you not just what to do. It's telling you what's in your heart. Because if you've ever looked on another woman, if you've ever looked on another man, you've committed adultery. Now, how does that hit you? You're like, whoa. You see, thou shalt not commit adultery all of a sudden got bigger, got harder, didn't it? It got serious. And this is the, the aspect of the law. And this is why God gave the law. So when it says it's going to abound, the word itself literally, it, it means in number, to multiply. Right? Now, if it's in number, that means where there was two, now there's four. Where there was four, there's eight. Or where there was a million, there's ten million. It's a number. 
But the next word is the interesting one. When it says, grace does much more abound, the word is hyperparisuo. Now, everybody knows what hyper means, right? Not hypo. Right? If someone has hypoglycemia, they have low blood sugar. What if they have hyperglycemia? High. Hyper is like we talk about speaking in hyperbole. That means you're exaggerating, right? This particular word is a, is a combination of three words. Hyper means super. It means to super exceed beyond measure, overflowing abundance, innumerable. Now consider the two. Where sin abounded in number, grace abounded innumerably. If I'm saying that right. So what's he basically trying to teach us here? Lexi smiled at me. I must not be saying it right. <laughs> <laughs> he's telling us something. Y'all remember the context, okay? What he's basically doing is he's comparing, okay? He's comparing grace to sin. And in comparing grace to sin, what is he really comparing? He's comparing Christ to Adam, okay? And so what he says is, where the nature of Adam abounded. And y'all think about it. Adam committed one sin. Sin, the wages of sin is death, and sin always has a corrupting effect. I mean, y'all know we say you tell one lie, you got to tell two, and on and on and on. But even in Adam's case, God shows us something in the Bible. Adam lived 930 years. People around him lived 900. Methuselah lived 969. But as sin began to multiply in the human race, in other words, as it began to work out its corruption, what began to happen to them? They began to die faster and faster. You know, that downward trend contended or continued for about 5,500 years. I mean, until the dark... Y'all know in the dark ages in Europe what the lifespan was? About 45. Yeah, but 38 is what I read. But yeah, it was, it was low. I mean, it was really low. Now, that trend has reversed due to chemistry and modern medicine here recently. Look, thank God for a lot of it. But thank God not for a lot of it. But anyway, the whole point being is sin has that degrading effect. Now, man teaches evolution. We're getting better and better. And the Bible says, no, we're getting worse and worse. I mean, y'all look out there. It's just, it, look, every nation does this. It, it, it doesn't matter. A human does this. We go up until 33 years old. They say that's when we reach our peak. And then what happens? It's all downhill from there, right? He, you know, I'm getting to where I can't even sit in my, at my desk for more than an hour. I got to get up every... I used to laugh at Art when he would tell me that. I said, no, I can sit there all day. He said, it don't bother me. Lex, he'll tell you, I'm up every hour now. If I don't stand up, bend over and stretch, I'm hurting. And so like today, I got done. I've been in there all day. I get done and I got Lexi in there pushing and pumping on my back. It just, we, we're going downhill, aren't we? And it's because sin always has that effect. But guess what? Grace has the opposite effect. Grace and righteousness have a growing and evolving effect. It always leads to life. One leads to death, the other leads to life. And so when he says that where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Now y'all think of that in terms of our security. I mean, what does that say to you? Beautiful. It's, it's the greatest thing in the world, isn't it? I mean, this is what we're really, you know, trying to be assured of. Look, let's look how many times Paul says this. Look in 5 9, okay? In 5 9, he says, much more than. Now, there's the word he keeps using, isn't it? Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Y'all remember the idea? If Christ gave His life for us when we were enemies, now that we're His children joined unto Him, how much more is He going to take care of us? So he says in 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more. He keeps saying it, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Look at verse 15. 
Not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Then in verse 17 he says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. I mean, this is his theme here, much more. And ultimately, how can we define it? Christ is innumerably more than Adam. Now, how powerful is Adam and his genes? About the second most powerful thing in the universe, isn't it? You cannot get away from it. He, you know, when I was young, I laugh now, I think about it. I don't know if Gina remembers, but I would get my hair cut and the lady would tell me, boy, you got some thick hair. You'll never have to worry about going bald. And I'd think, Ugh. she'd tell me that all the time. One of them told my mom that my hair was swollen. Do you remember that? Yes. And she called up my Aunt Sheila who knew something. She said, Marlene, that's nuts. There's no such thing as swollen hair. I just had some thick pine straw hair. Look. <laughs> I mean, there ain't anything you can do. Sorry, Maddie, if you're watching. There isn't anything you can do about it, is there? Why? It's in your genes. Just as sure as that is, that sin is in us and it's going to work itself out and it's going to lead to death. You can't even compare the two how much greater it is that if you're in Christ, grace is what you're being dealt with and God is going to continue to deal with us in grace. I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna, no, I'm going to fail at this, but y'all think about it. When did God determine He was going to deal with people in grace? Before the foundation of the world. And did God set His sight and pick some people? <coughs> Folks, if God determined that I'm going to deal with these in grace, then what's God going to do? Just He's going to do that. And we tend to have the idea that He'll deal with us in grace until we fall short. and then, No. His grace abounds more. Look, even when He has to chastise us for our sins, it's still in grace. Hey, Y'all hear me talk about how much I love my granny. Does she beat me all the time? You don't ever hear me talk about my papa. I loved him, but it wasn't the same. You see, even chastisement is love, isn't it? So... When do you decide how you're going to deal? You know, I'm going to use Sienna as an example. Me and Lexi made an absolute conscience decision. We're going to get this girl, right? And when we made that decision, what did we decide? We're going to raise her up. We're going to deal with her. Did we ever say, I never said to the judge, you know, Your Honor, we're willing to do this, but Lexi and I have discussed it now. This is as long as she don't eat too much. <laughs> You know, it'd have been over that night, wouldn't it? <laughs> the point is, God made a conscious, judicial decision. And what did He say? These I'm going to deal with in grace. And so how does He deal with us? In grace. Folks, He will never deal with us in wrath. We have been delivered from the wrath. That's the greatest promise in all the world, isn't it? And yet by the same token, how did He decide He was going to deal with the world? In wrath. He will not deal with the world in grace like that. Now there is a certain type of grace that's called universal grace, just long-suffering grace, and even that grace has its subject as us. In other words, why didn't God destroy the world? Because His people are in it. Why do the, the unbelievers have the rain and the sunshine? Because the believers need it. It said He makes His rain fall on the just and the unjust. But folks, God is so good to us. He has given us a Savior and He has made certain that He will have to deal with us in grace. How? Because Christ has paid all the debt. If God were not to deal with us in grace, you realize God Himself would be unrighteous? He can't do that. I mean, this is just incredible. This is the covenant of redemption. Now, grace doesn't just counteract Adam's sin. We talked about this last time. It overflows it. You know, we could say it, I think I probably said it last time like this. The grace of God doesn't just take us from our fallen position and bring us back to Adam's position. It overflows that. It goes far above all heavens. So we've not just been redeemed to, to Adam's uh, starting point. We've been put in Christ. Okay? So this is the grace of God. Go over to 1 Corinthians 15. There's a great verse about it. <clears throat> I 
I think this probably says it as good as it could be said, but let's just read it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, now the Apostle's talking about resurrection. And look, resurrection is just the final installment of our salvation. Look, we have been saved 100%. We've, we are saved, we're being saved, we'll always be saved, and when the resurrection comes, we'll be saved, that's it, we're done. But he says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, talking about our body, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then at that time shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We could read this verse that way. We could say, where sin abounded, grace hath swallowed it up. It's that kind of an idea, okay? Now, uh, there's, there's something to kind of talk about with this. <clears throat> if we go back in church history, okay? In the beginning... It's, it's the gospels being preached and it's salvation by grace through faith. And right away, what is the first doctrine that men begin to attack? The doctrine of justification by faith. They go right behind Paul and they say, hold it, hold it, hold it to the church at Galatia. Yes, 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 that's true, but you got to be circumcised and keep the law. So salvation is not just justification by grace. It's justification by grace mostly and a little pinch of works. Now, if you read church history, what began to happen? Yeah. Folks, the battle started. It never ended. And where, what happened, at, by the time you get over, and look, I don't mean it went away. God always had His people, okay? The doctrine was always there. But in the multitude of the visible church, in church history, by the time you get over here to, to the period of time we call the Dark Ages, okay, what was the, the multitude of mankind believing? Salvation by sacraments, by Mary, by eating bread and drinking wine. The Catholic Church had completely corrupted it. What was the Reformation all about? It was about justification by grace. I mean, look, it started before Him, but who's the main man God used? I mean, one man. God turned the world around with one man, Martin Luther. You know all Martin Luther saw? He rediscovered justification by grace. And, you know, no matter how they threatened him or what they did, he couldn't, they couldn't shake him. What he saw had thrilled him so much that he started writing about it. And, you know, it was like a disease they couldn't control. I mean, seriously, it got out and there was no re reeling it in. And so what happened? Justification by faith. Look, I'll just put it like here. Justification by faith for 1,500 years fell away amongst the visible church. And then all of a sudden it come roaring back, didn't it? And you know what happened? It began to be preached like it was not preached before. And what began to happen? People began to be saved. Look over there, Lexi. <laughs> People began to get saved and it began to be... Well, I made a mess. I'm sorry. Okay, so I wanted to make a comment to y'all about this, though, how this affects us, right? Um... If you look at the hymns, this is fascinating. I saw where a preacher said this, and I went back and I thought, I want to check that out. And boy, if he isn't right. I had in my mind what hymns were like, but I wasn't that sure. Have y'all ever heard the hymns the church would sing in 1200, 13, 14, 1500, 80? Oh, you know what I mean? And it was like a bunch of monks looking down, wasn't it? chanting and it was just it's scary it's creepy oh, yeah. I mean I see those old movies it's kind of creepy isn't it if you look at the words even the words were like that it's because they lost sight of God they lost sight of what we're talking about tonight and so they begin to sing look even the church itself the church started out in the first century I mean a ball of fire but down through the dark ages monasticism took over I mean monks run everything what was a monk's not not all of them, but for the most part, what was a monk's idea of Christianity? Separate from the world. They're dirty. Keep away from them and serve God. Is that what we're told to do? And so what happened was it became a, a religion of monks singing downtrodden, oh, right? Read the hymns that come out of the Protestant Reformation. What do you get? 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. You get a picture of a bunch of people that aren't walking around in solitude. They're looking up, praising God. And the reason the hymns that come out of the Reformation are that way is because they saw. They saw the assurance of salvation. I mean, look at the hymns that uh, Charles Wesley wrote. I mean, it's incredible the stuff. This guy saw it. I mean, he had an assurance and nobody could rob him of it. And so when you hear a saved person uh, singing, you don't hear a saved person downtrodden. Even when we're downtrodden, Paul said, in persecutions, we still can celebrate, can't we? Now, why? The assurance of our salvation. Okay? Without assurance, we don't have anything. Now, um, now, let's talk about how the law increases sin. Okay? <clears throat> this is important. We'll cover this with the time we've got left. How the law increases sin. Because okay? we said, again, flip back over there to Romans 5. He says, uh, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Okay? So, that the offense might abound means that the increase... Law in, or the law increases sin, so let's talk about how. All right, number one, the law. Number one, it increases the knowledge of sin. Okay, now the law increases the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> Go over and look at uh, Romans 3.20. In Romans 3.20, Paul says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law then gives a knowledge of sin. It doesn't mean that men don't know they're sinners without the law. Because we've already seen, even before the law, they died, didn't they? And we know that we all know before we ever learned any law, we're sinners. Look, a little child knows it's a sinner uh, as soon as you give it a rule, doesn't it? But you know, we all know the child's a sinner. In other words, we know a child is a sinner and they're selfish. How you get a little child is selfish. Mine takes it, right? But whenever you tell them, hey, you need to share with your friends, now all of a sudden what happens? They don't want to. See, they're going to begin to understand. For some reason, I don't want to do that. Law has that, has that ability. So it increases the knowledge of sin. Look at Romans 7. And look, so much of what we're about to talk about, we're going to keep going to Romans 7 to get it. And the reason is because in Romans 6 and 7, Paul's going to expound these things. And for what the law and sin, it was chapter 7. So watch what he says in Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. He said, Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. He says, For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. As soon as the law, Paul saw the law, said, it, it not even don't commit adultery, don't even think about it. What did he goes like, whoa, it come down on him, didn't it? Okay, so the law gives sin the added character. It removes all doubt. It takes away ambiguity. Look, don't we all know we're speeding? And then we pass the, stop, the speed limit sign, and guess what? It's official. You know it, right? Okay, so the law removes all doubt. It removes ignorance. You know, we say, well, I didn't know. Well, when he gave the law, that's it. You know now, right? Now, it gives sin the added character of transgression. See, where the, there is no law, there is no transgression because transgression means to overstep the law. Okay, so the way it does this is it defines sin and it makes it rebellion against God. If God's law says, thou shalt not, now when I do it, it's not just that I feel like it's probably wrong. Now I know God would not have me do it. So then what does it make it? It makes it rebellion against God. And so what has it done with that sin? It has magnified it, okay? It's magnified. That's the whole idea. It's not just a negative act when, when, you know, we say, well, I'm pretty sure I'm falling short. No. When there's a law in place, it's a positive act against God, isn't it? Okay, so this is how the law does it. All right. The law tells me what I should do, but the law doesn't give me any power to do anything about it, does it? Did Moses' law give the people any power to keep? No. All it did was told them, this is what you've got to do. And then how did that leave them feeling? Don't measure up. He don't measure up. Or 
self-righteousness. That's the two results. Or, boy, I'm something special because I keep some of them. But for the person that's sincere, you look at it and you think, I'm in trouble here. Hey, this is how the law works. Now, number two, how it increases the knowledge of sin. It reveals the nature or the true character of sin. Y'all know everybody can put on a show, and nobody puts on a better show than sin. And I don't mean us sinners, I mean sin itself. Sin is deceitful and it's deceptive. Look at why we're in 7 at verse 13. Go to 7.13, Paul says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now that old English is hard to understand, but let me just put it into words for you here. Paul said, he uses a word there that means a fulcrum. Y'all know what a fulcrum is? A fulcrum is, um, all right, I had a stonemason. Hey, I would move rocks with the backhoe and we'd build waterfalls and put them in place, but, but sometimes I couldn't be there, and my stone mason could move the biggest stone I could buy. He move a thousand pound stone with these two steel bars. He was 60 years old. What he would do is, he would get the bar under one and he'd take a small rock, and put the small rock next to the big rock. Now you put the bar under it, and guess what? You've got a point, a point of leverage. And he can move that big, he'd walk it right over where he wanted, and that little stone is called a fulcrum. It's called a fulcrum on a diving board where, where the, the board goes out and it sets on it because that fulcrum is the point of leverage that shoots you up, right? A fulcrum is that. You take something, something small and move a big load with it. What he's saying is this. Sin is so evil and so rotten that it's able to take something holy and righteous like God's law and move the mass of humanity to want to break it. Now it takes a rotten thing to be able to pervert God's law and use it against God's own purposes, doesn't it? And that's what he's saying. Sin is so rotten it can even misuse God's law. Now how does it do that? Tell us not to do it and what happens? Sin in us makes us want to do it. So that's the kind of thing he's saying there. It reveals the true character of sin. It shows the depth of sin. It shows its vileness and its harmful intentions. Go back to verse 5. Watch how he describes it here. In verse 5 he says, For when we were in the flesh, this before we were saved, the motions or emotions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Before we were saved, what's the best the law could do? Bring forth death. Y'all know the harder we try to keep the law, the more you fail, isn't it? When you're under that kind of a thing, hey, the law, it just condemns us. Why? Because we're sinners. So it brings out that, that idea there. Right? The law makes clear the requirement, and when we see the requirement, what do we learn next? Our struggle. I mean, y'all, we, we've all... I'm trying to think of a way to say this. Somebody says, uh, hey, I, I want you to come over and do this. You say, all right, I can do that. And they say, well, hold on now. You think it's got to be here, but it's got to be here. And then all of a sudden, what do you realize? I can't do that. See, the law shows us something. It shows us the power of sin. All right, now another thing the law does. The law reveals the reign of sin over the human heart. This is all the knowledge of sin. See, we tend to think of sin as something we do or don't do. But the Bible teaches sin is a thing. It's a power that reigns over us. If you don't think sin reigns over us, you're not being honest. From the time we're born, what drives us? It's sin. And so it shows us this. It expounds upon and examines the results of Adam's sin over every member of the human race. All right? How many laws did Adam break? One. Okay? Come over here, and how many did God give Israel? 613. Could Adam keep one? No. Well, if Adam couldn't keep one, how are we going to keep 613? You see, it shows us the depth of this thing. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the law shows me who's really reigning over my heart. It really does, if we're honest. And I got the example here of a smoker. I heard uh, James uh, 
Montgomery Boyce used this example, and I thought it was the best one I'd ever heard for this verse. He said, all right, you got a smoker. And the smoker says, well, I can, I can quit smoking. I say, why don't you quit smoking? I could if I wanted to. I don't want to. We've heard this, haven't we? You get someone that's a chain smoker. Now, that person smokes cigarette after cigarette after cigarette, and they say, I can quit any time I want. They probably could. But let a doctor tell them, this is killing you, and if you don't stop, you're going to die in a couple months. Now they've got to stop. Guess what? They won't have the power to do it. Hadn't we all been in this position? I can walk right away from some piece of food if I don't, not, don't taste good and I'm not interested, but tell me I can't eat it and I'm on a diet. Let the doctor tell me if you eat more sugar, you're in trouble. And y'all know what? Y'all ever noticed who? Sugar, who seems to like sugar the most? People that have already been diagnosed with diabetes. He, we were just talking about somebody we knew that had diabetes, and every night they'd stay up late after everybody went to bed. Why? So they could eat. They want that sugar. Why? Because it's off limits. Look, we've all got this. I ain't picking on smokers. We've all got this, don't we? If you tell us we have got to do something or else, what happens? The pressure comes on us, and we find out we can't do it. Hey, this is what the law does. The law shows me this. All right? Uh, <clears throat> the law also reveals the deceitfulness of sin. Okay? The very law that God gave that's good for man. Is there a single law that's not good for us? Every one God gave was good for us. But what does it tell us? How deceitful is sin? The very law meant to help me makes me want to rebel against the things that are good for me. You t I could ask Sienna, what do you want for dinner? If it's just me and Sienna home. Ice cream. There you go. <laughs> but I mean, why? Because you say, well, ice cream tastes good. Yeah, but that's not the issue. The issue is we want it because it's off limits. That's what makes us want it. And sin's able to do that, okay? And the, the worst part about the deceitfulness of sin is that lost people don't know sin's reigning over them. Look, we need to feel sorry for them because they have a tyrant ruling over them. And the tyrant is so tricky and so deceitful that they don't even know they're being ruled over. Hey, y'all ever met somebody? That, yeah. Hey, y'all, you know there are people, y'all ever met somebody that can insult you and you smile and hug and they walk off and you're long wise thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The law, is, it's got, it imprisons people and people will act like they want it. They don't know. It's because sin is that powerful. All right, now the second thing the law does, it increases the conviction of sin. Okay? Increases conviction of sin. Now how does it do this? Well, ignorance is replaced with guilt. You know, you can say, I didn't know. But when the law is written down and given to you, what are you going to say then? No. So where, whereby your conscience knew it was wrong, now you're absolutely pronounced guilty, aren't you? Okay? When we see sin as rebellion against God, we begin to see ourselves worthy of His wrath, don't we? You know, when we just do that which is against our conscience, we don't think we deserve wrath. But when we see that we have offended God, then how do you begin to look at your sin? You begin to feel different, don't you? Hey, do y'all remember David? David fell into adultery, lying, murder. Y'all remember? And for over nine months, David lived, it looked like, with a clear conscience. He looked like, now, y'all know his conscience bothered him. It did. But you remember when Nathan came to him and told him that little parable? about the man that took the guy's only sheep and ate it and killed it. The guy had thousands of sheep, but he wanted the other guy's sheep and took it. And David rose up in righteous indignation and said, that man's got to die. And y'all remember what Nathan said? Thou art the man. What did that do to him? It opened his eyes and he become aware of what he had done. Y'all know we can all justify what we want to do and make it right in our own eyes and we'll believe it. And we'll go that way until we're convicted. And then so when David saw that, he wrote Psalm 51. Do y'all remember what he said? He, he poured out his heart to God, but he said, Lord, against you and you only have I done this sin and committed this act. Now certainly he sinned against Bathsheba and against Uriah. That wasn't what was bothering him. He had been made guilty in the eyes of God. And what did he know? 
He deserved the wrath of God. See, that's how the law does. It convicts us more deeply, and it points what we already know by feeling to make it actual transgression against God. Okay? Now, the third way. Sin increases our desire to... or the law increases our desire to sin. All right, we all know this is true for sure. Sin has so defiled us that that which is good repulses us. Doesn't it? Look, a teenager is the best example of this to me. A teenager wants to go out and do what? Anything he's not supposed to do. Now, we all know why. What's the teen doing? He's rebelling. He's reached the age of rebellion. Well, folks, that's all sin is. Rebellion against God. So that's, that's what it does. Increases our desire. Now, the knowledge of sin has not ever prevented anyone from sinning. It's the exact opposite. Now, what I mean by that is this. You can enact laws to, to help rein in sin. And people will avoid certain things. But they're not doing that out of a respect for God. They're doing it out of self-preservation. Did God's law ever deter any lost person from, in their heart, desiring to do a thing? No. No. It made them desire it more. And look, nothing's changed. We're still this way today. I'm going to give you all a few examples. Everybody remember Prohibition? Okay, watch how it works. Prohibition, they, they signed into law, right? And they said, it's illegal to drink. Do y'all realize that drinking in the United States went up three times? Yeah. That's what Prohibition did. It increased drinking in our country three times, 300%. They said basically hardly no women drank before in our country. Some, I mean, I'm sure, but for the most part, women didn't drink. Well, guess what Prohibition did? It made it cool to go out and drink. Why? It's the thing to do, you know, the speakeasies. Matter of fact, I got a quote I wanted to give you all. Vice President John Garner, I think he was in... Uh, Roosevelt's administration, but I'm not sure. Anyway, Vice President John Garner, they said, would offer all his, uh, would bring all his visitors in, and he'd give them a drink during Prohibition, and this is what he would say. Let's strike a blow for liberty. He'd pour them both a glass and say, now, let's strike a blow against what? The law. We're going to do what we want to do. Who cares about the law? You see the attitude? Well, that's the attitude we all have by nature. I'm going to give you all another one. Um, I don't want to say it exactly like this. Uh, certain kinds of education, they begin teaching children in school. We all know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I had a teacher. I can remember Mr. Wimberly. Yeah. Mr. Wimberly, seventh grade, the first time I had ever heard some of these things. Now, look, I heard stuff from my friends and all, but when they started showing me pictures in school and talking about these things, did it deter us? It piqued our interest. We didn't realize a lot of these things. What has been the result? They said, we're going to educate them and that will do away with the problem. Has it? <laughs> the problems multiplied, isn't it? Why? Sin. Folks, that's what sin is. Now here's probably my favorite. I can tell you all as someone that hunted growing up, I have never seen a no hunting sign that hadn't been shot. Have you, Tony? <laughs> If you go hunting and you see no hunting, I guarantee it's going to be full of buckshot, isn't it? I mean, yeah, always. No trespassing out in the woods, same thing. It's going to be shot up. Why? Rebel, folks, that's the picture right there. It's, oh, look at there. Law, yeah, let me show you. You see, that's what law does. It, it brings out that sin, that sin uh, to the surface in us now. All right, now, the last thing it does, and most importantly, in a person that's going to be saved, sin increases our knowledge of the need of a Savior. Now, this isn't a person that, that's going to be saved. Does sin, when we, when we finally come under the, the strength of the law and we try and perform under the law and we finally begin to see what we are and, and begin to understand how much we deserve the wrath of God, then what do we begin to do? We, we, hey, i got to have help here. I need a Savior. And Paul says this. Look at Romans 3.20. You know, I always tell y'all, to know the good news, you got to know the bad news. Well, this is what we're talking about. Why did God give the law? 
to magnify the bad news. And what's the bad news? We're all sinners. And the law magnifies it. Okay? Um, in uh, Romans 3.20, Paul says, uh, 3, 9, no, 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now what does the knowledge of sin lead us to? More sin. It, it, it'll, a lost person, sure, but a person that's going to be saved begins to cry out for a Savior, don't they? Go to Galatians 3 and watch how Paul puts it there. All right, in Galatians 3, Paul sums it all up for us. He says in verse uh, 22, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now, think what he means here. Why did the law, why did God give a law that condemned everybody? Because how's God going to send His Son to do it until He proves nobody else can do it? Now, if God had waited till here to prove that, then who, how they could men have been saved back here? They couldn't have. So what did God do? He made an agreement with His Son before the foundation of the world. He's going to be the head of His people. And He set Adam up as the head of His people. And by the grace of God, when Adam failed, what did God do? Right there that day, He eliminated the entire human race. Now, what did that make it possible for Him to do? Save Adam. If, if He had said, well, Adam, you've sinned, but I don't know what Abel... Abel might be the one that can do it. Could He have offered a sacrifice? No. If it had been humanly possible, could Christ have died for us? So what did God prove at the very first day? It's not possible. Folks, that's the grace of God. Look, condemning us in Adam is the grace of God because if God had not found everybody guilty, He couldn't have sent someone to do that. He would have said, well, we're going to have to wait. There might be one born tomorrow that's going to do it. But that's not what happened. And so, it, thank God He did it this way. Now He says, verse 23, But before faith came, before a person saved, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Before we're saved, how do we all try and get to God? Our performance, something we do. Even if we think it's some act of faith we do. No, we try and do it. He says in 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that's the purpose of the law for a saved person. The law is a, the schoolmaster word, we don't have this word really today in our culture, it's a pedagogue. And what it means is, in the Roman world, they would go out and they would conquer other nations. And they would bring home slaves. I mean, just whoever, they'd make slaves out of them and bring them home and make them serve in their house. Well, what they would do, the people with money, is they would get a male slave. He, his title was the pedagogue. He didn't work in the house or whatever. His sole function was to take the, the male child, the heir, who was still young. And while he's young, he's going to begin to teach him. He's going to walk him to school and make sure he gets to school safe. He's going to make sure he's going to take care of him until he comes of age. Now think about a saved person. When did God know He was going to save? All right, here's somebody right here gets saved. Here's the day they're saved, right? When did God know He was going to save this person? Before the foundation of the world. The person is born right here. Here's the day they're saved. What did God put them under between the two? The law by nature. All of us grow up under a law, don't we? And so what does that law do for the person that's going to be saved? It, it teaches them, and all the while it's teaching them, until ultimately it gets them to look away from one thing and look unto another. Now what does the law get us to look away from? Self. It gets us to see how bad sin is. It puts it under a magnifying glass so we can see, not only am I not what I ought to be, as Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. Now, what made Paul think he was the chief of sinners? He knew the law, folks. He knew what he had done. He was guilty. And so what God does is He gives us the law, and before we're saved, that law begins to work on us. 
And even if you don't know Moses' law, we know the Ten Commandments basically, don't we? I mean, we know something's wrong. And as we do begin to see the law and understand the law more, what does the law begin to do? Do you begin to feel better and better about yourself? You begin to feel worse and worse. Well, how bad does it have to get? It gets so bad, you know, there's no hope for me. And what do we, a person that's going to be saved do? We begin to cry out on God. We begin to look for a Savior, don't we? You say, well, that's the person seeking. No, that's a person being forced to seek. What's forcing them? God. The Spirit of God uses the law like a schoolmaster to get us. It keeps us in line. It beats and spanks on us and gets us and grows and keeps us going in the right direction until finally it gets us in the right position and lifts our head up. And what do we do? We look away from Moses' law unto Christ. And that's the whole point the Apostle's trying to make here. That's what the law was given for. God uses the law side by side with sin that came into the world to magnify the sin and get people to call on Christ. Okay? Any questions about that? No? Alright. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for these things. Lord, we thank You for that law that condemns us. We thank You for our Savior which saves us. We thank You for making justification by faith and not by works. Lord, we would have no chance. But above all these, we thank You for the love that it took to give Your Son to pay the price and the debt that we owe. We ask that You strengthen us and build us up. Teach us to worship Christ in a worthy manner and to serve Him with a humble heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.